He was the world's first black professional footballer. He was the world's first fastest man on the planet. Professional cricketer, professional rugby player, and a cycling champion. He was just a remarkable all-round sportsman. What it means is that this young man is almost unarguably the world's greatest pioneer and trailblazer for the black community in a variety of sports. I mean, his story is unique. I suppose my long-term thing is to get as many people in the world as possible to know the name of Arthur Wharton. It's Andrew Mensah here, and today I've travelled all the way up to Darlington to discover a hidden gem in British black history. Today I'm looking to find out more about a man named Arthur Walton, who was the first professional black footballer. At the age of 19, he travelled all the way from Jamestown Gold Coast, which is now known as Ghana. Now, me being of Ghanaian descent, this is really, really special to me. So let's see how much more we can find out about this remarkable man. Mural is amazing. Nice to meet you. You too. Welcome to the Arthur Wharton Foundation Centre. Thank you for having me. So, just tell me more about Arthur Wharton to start with and this, what, how his story inspired you to start this whole foundation. Yeah, sure. Well, Arthur Wharton was born in a little fisherfolk village in Ghana called Jamestown, Accra. It was then British Accra. He was born on the year of the abolition of slavery in America, so very, very poignant, considering where we are today. He came over to Darlington in 1883 to study as a Methodist preacher. And there, the then trainer of Darlington Cricket and Football Club saw this young Ghanaian with a turn of speed and a power of strength. The rest is history, bro. This guy became the world's first black professional footballer, the world's first ever official fastest man on the planet, professional cricketer, professional rugby player, cycling champion, all at the same time. <laughs> it's crazy. But arching all of that was this remarkable humanitarian spirit in a bleak Victorian England, during the industrial era, it was cold, it was poverty-stricken, disease-ridden. This young Ghanaian played seven games of football in 10 days to feed the poor. Wow. For charity, in the face of his own adversity. That humanitarian aspect, that's what it's all about. This young man achieved all of what we've just said, and yet he died on the 12th of December, 1930, this young Ghanaian, and he laid in an unmarked grave until 1997, stroke 98. Every black footballer today, every black athlete, every black cricketer, black rugby player, black cyclist, that's your pioneer. That's the beginning of our story in sport. This whole wall that we're going to walk down now, it will be a timeline of the campaign and of Arthur's story. So we're here. I'm feeling good. I've got the Ghanaian flag. There's kente cloths. All we're missing is basically maybe jollof rice, like oh, or something man. like that. We need something. But I want to go more specific in, in his career. So if we come to this photo here mm. of him actually playing, while you look at that photo, Andrew, that same year, 1887, he equalled that fastest time in the world at Stourbridge. This guy was phenomenal. <laughs> it's crazy stuff. I'm hearing that he played the first game at Anfield. That's... First of September, 1892, right? Arthur Wharton in goal for Rotherham against Liverpool at their first ever game at Anfield. Wow, that's crazy, man. Arthur came to the UK pre-1882, but he actually came to Darlington in 1883. This young man just wanted to play football. The last game that Arthur Wharton ever played was against Manchester United. They were called Newton Heath. So we've always had this lovely intrinsic link with Manchester United. So we went through there, we met, uh, I requested to meet Rio and Wes Brown. I felt they were the two that I wanted to kind of embrace Yeah, it. you've got a picture of them here, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah, I didn't, I had forgotten that was up there. We have people like Paul Cannaville, 
obviously the first black footballer for Chelsea. I mean, that was 1982, 83. How long did that? That's 100 years after Arthur. Wow. That's how long it took Chelsea to get a black player play for them. This is a nice little portrait of Arthur Wharton here at St. George's Park, because there's the statue there. So I want to know how that must have felt, finally, him getting the recognition he deserved in that sense. So the point of it being at St. George's Park was it was the National Football Centre, FA Learning Education and Coach Development. What better place than to put this young man rising from the centre of the St. George's Cross as an inspirational, motivational, captivating personality for our England teams. So guys, this trophy I'm holding in my hands is called the Cleveland Challenge Cup. And it was in 1887 where Arthur Wharton held this cup. So if you can see in this photo, it's the exact same one from that photo. So it's kind of surreal, like holding, holding this trophy right now, learning about him throughout the day. And I've been told that I'm the third Ghanaian to hold this. So it's Arthur Wharton, Christian Atsu and Andrew Mensah. So right now it just feels real surreal to hold this cup, knowing the backstory and all that I've learned about him. So it just shows the importance, not only learning history, but learning black history. It does look great from here, though. It does. It's amazing. It just literally stops the street. So you are the great-great-grandson? Great-granddaughter. Great-granddaughter of Arthur, of Arthur yeah. Talk to me about growing up with the history. How big of a thing was it in your family? We obviously didn't know anything about Arthur. My mum always said there was, there was something in the family that wasn't talked about. My mum finding photos of this man, Arthur, that nobody... My mum didn't even really know much about. A guy put something in our local newspaper asking for information about Arthur Wharton. Um, and my mum contacted him because we'd got these photos. And it sort of all just stemmed from there. And, and it just really amazing. Um, obviously, we were so proud when we did realise who he was. Obviously, Arthur came from Jamestown, Gold Coast, which is Ghana, which is my descendant as well. Yeah. And I heard that you actually went to Ghana. We did, yes. Yeah, so yeah. just talk to me about going to Ghana and, and seeing the people and uh, the roots, his roots, and ultimately your roots as well. Like, how, how of a oh, surreal such, experience yeah, was it? Yeah, something I never thought would, would happen. It was such an emotional experience. We found family and we were invited to their home and it's quite a large family and they were so welcoming. Mm. I mean, one thing that stood <laughs> out when we walked in, they were surprised as well because they expected us <laughs> being black. So they didn't quite get, you know, it was, we didn't think you'd be white. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Going to Ghana and seeing your relatives and building that connection, did that also build a connection internally towards Arthur as well for you? I think it did. He's my great-grandfather and he'll always be a great-grandfather and children, my, my grandchildren, they're going to know as they get older, they'll know who he is um, and hopefully they'll talk about him and pass all that information on to theirs because we do want to keep it his memory going as a family as well. So Dorothy, we're here with your son and granddaughter. Yes, Three yeah. generations right mm -hmm. here, learning about the whole history today and getting to know you guys. It's kind of been a bit overwhelming for me and just kind of seeing how someone who grew up in places like my mum grew up can just have this much impact. So it must be crazy on, on how it's impacted your family. Obviously, we're very unexpected at time and it's been something that we've, we've all spent time looking into and researching. It's had a positive, certainly had a positive effect on our life and I hope he's inspired a lot of other people. I grew up as a runner myself, so to then learn that I'd got a descendant who held records for <laughs> sprinting, it were 
they were unbelievable. I think my dad always wanted to take credit for my good running <laughs> abilities, but then he, really. <laughs> he, he got passed on to Arthur when we found out about him. So yeah, I hope he inspires a lot of other people as well. And seeing stuff like this, I think it, it, it certainly will do. It's a really, really important day for the foundation. It's a really important day for Darlington. Mr. Mayor, welcome. It is an absolute honour and pleasure to be stood here to launch this magnificent piece of art, which I think will rival the Angel of the North, and I'm not exaggerating. I think it's right and proper we do it today. I think it's right and proper that Darlington recognises Arthur Wharton in this way. Today's a really historic day. This is the first time Darlington has had a real, you know, strong testament to anybody in terms of sport, really. And it's the name Arthur Wharton that we see here today. We say Arthur Wharton, number one. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you. We've been involved with a the Darlington West Indian Association over the last maybe 30 years or such. Looking at it from the road and even close up, it just looks so real. And the guy who's done it has done a wonderful job. I think it's, it's really important. It does make a big difference. It gives that recognition to um, black people. Um, it brings up that rewriting of history um, to the forefront. Um, in Black History Month, it's really, really important that, you know, this is happening here locally in a predominantly white um, town, really. That is the most important piece of artwork in the town now. And it's a really poignant, poignant piece because it marks the 155th anniversary of Arthur today. It's been emotional, that's to say the least. You know, you have your private moments where you get touched really deeply and then you have those moments where you come out and you just can't stop smiling and the cheekbones hurt. And then you look and you think, wow, have we done him justice? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we've done him justice, all right. The beautiful thing about this is that, yeah, it might be Black History Month and we might be celebrating this story because of Black History Month, but this mural's going to be here forever. From this point on, it's a marker, it's a signpost that something around here is happening. And what we do around here has got to be befitting of that piece of artwork. So we want to make sure that the legacy of Arthur impacts this area dramatically. For those in power and authority, black lives will never matter to those people until black history matters. When black history matters, and it's taught on a par with other histories in the classroom, in the workplace, the next generation will not have those prejudices. We will see meaningful change. That will be Arthur's legacy.